And now I'm happy to introduce Neil Mitchell. Neil Mitchell is a longtime member of the Haskell community. He's the author of several packages um, and he shares his insights that he gained using Haskell in his uh, own projects and commercially in papers on his blog and in talks. And I'm happy that he's doing so today um, here uh, on Unihack. And yeah, uh, Neil, please. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to talk about migrating HLint to the GHC API. Uh, so what is HLint? So uh, it's a tool for suggesting possible improvements to Haskell code. Uh, if you're a Haskell user, you may well already be using it on your CI or in your IDE. Uh, it's available on GitHub. <coughs> and the kind of thing it says is, well, I looked at your code. I found you used concat dollar map escape CS, but actually you could have replaced it with concat map escape CS. Uh, so, so it's kind of to try and the, the motivation for writing HLint was very much, I was seeing a lot of uh, code reviews that were all the low hanging fruit. People were saying, replace this function with that function. You've, doub you've doubled that let, that should be a better variable name. And not getting to the whole, well, it's really dumb to call a web request here in this place. So the idea is HLint is kind of like meant to be the first pass of code review. So real humans can do real code review. So how does HLint work? Very approximately. So for each file individually, and this is one of the kind of key things about HLint that has always been the case, and I think probably always will be the case. It works on individual files. It doesn't know what that file imports accurately. It doesn't know fixity information from those imports. It just sees a file in isolation. So that means it can run in parallel. It can run even if you don't have the libraries set up. It can, you don't need to configure it. It's very much file in, hints out. And the way it works is it passes the file into an abstract syntax tree, examines that abstract syntax tree with lots of possible hints, and reports the one that ones that match. If you look at that description, passing the file into an AST is very important, and examining the AST is very important, and everything else is pretty much noise. So it's really an AST, an AST transformation engine. So HLint is quite old now, and I was kind of going back through the history to compare it with the very, very first version of HLint I wrote. So HLint is 14 years old, which kind of astounds me. Um, I've been married for the last 11 years. I've had a son for the last seven and a bit, almost eight years. But HLint has been a part of my life longer than either of those two. Um, and during that time, we've changed most things about HLint. Uh, we used to configure it with Haskell files, and now we configure it with YAML files. 14 years ago, YAML wasn't really a thing people were using. Uh, it used to be in Darks, it's now in Git. It used to have a mere two hints, and now it has 821. It used to be called Dr. Haskell, uh, but I changed the name to HLN at some point. Much better name, probably someone else's suggestion because I suck at naming. When, we f when it first started, I was actually developing HLN in Hugs. You know, for those of you old enough to remember Hugs, it was a Haskell interpreter from the long ago before, but even GHC was only on, on 6.4 back then. Changed license from GPL to BSD. <clears throat> it's grown substantially, so it's now 9,000 lines long. And the very, very first version was based on the output of YHC core. Uh, so this was, you used the YHC compiler which has been dead for a very, very long time. It spat out its core representation and the hints were applied on that. But about two years after that, I changed to using a parser library. So which parser library did I pick and why? So from 2006 to 2008, we were using YHC core and that had a dependency on YHC. So most people weren't able to use HLint because most code didn't uh, compile with YHC. And I see a question, which were the first two hints supported 14 years ago? They were 
concat applied to map should be concat map and map f of map g should be map f dot g um, but yes uh, because it only really supported yhc core it was mostly unused so in 2008 i wanted to pick a parser and what were the pascal parsers available well there was ghc api which is basically the internals of ghc uh, i like to think of it as kind of you've taken ghc you've sliced it open with a knife and you've let the guts fall on the pavement where they lie um, it really is just the internals of ghc that you can get to there was haskell source which had been forked from the ghc parser in 2004 or earlier not really sure um, as a standalone parsing library and then there was haskell source x which was forked from either the ghc parser directly or from haskell source but had been kind of polished and given a bit of love so uh, Haskell source didn't seem like it was going anywhere by 2008. It looked a bit dead and unmaintained. Um, so I had to pick between Haskell source X and the GHC API. So looking at them in 2008, I was comparing the kind of stable since 2004 Haskell source X with the GHC API that had, had been around for about a year and a half. It was getting significant changes in every release. It was really hard to modify because you had to modify GHC and then wait for the release cycle. And back then, GHC release cycles were measured in years. They aimed to do one every year and they usually failed. Um, the other thing is the GHC API was huge. It was like 30 megabytes. And this meant that it took like minutes for it to link on my really old crappy computer. Uh, in contrast, like the Haskell Source X was a really easy to modify library with a fast release cycle. And you know, it had only been forked from GHC relatively recently, so it was pretty much compatible with GHC. Very responsive maintainer, Nicholas Broberg. Uh, so at that time, it was kind of obvious. Use Haskell Source X. It's a much nicer experience, much better. So in 2008, we did. Haskell Source X worked really well. It has a simple API good documentation. It's essentially a big data type describing Haskell. And then alongside each constructor, they had a little example of the syntax that would produce it. Uh, you could then print out that source, which is really nice. You could pattern match against it. And given how HLIM works, it's maybe 90% pattern matching. So that was really handy. And then later, as a summer of code project, they added precise span information. So this was saying, exactly where each token came from so we could round trip and give it really good uh, information to the users. So Haskell Source X worked really, really well. Very happy with it. Apart from that whole fork from GHC in 2004 bit. So when it was forked, it was 100% compatible with GHC. But over time, as GHC added every single extension, it got just that little bit less compatible. Um, and, and the problem is uh, that GHC uh, doesn't really define the extensions they add. They don't say exactly what they're going to do. They roughly have a flavor. That's slightly improved with the GHC's proposal process. But below are three examples of where Haskell source X couldn't pass a file, but GHC could. So in the HG cast with, those double tilders are upsetting um, uh, Haskell source X because it's getting confused with type coercions. Uh, in the light orange, you've got nested view patterns. Uh, that works because of the fixity of the arrow for the view pattern in GHC, but fails in Haskell source X. And then in the light green, you've got type open brackets colon plus plus colon. That failed because there's a colon at the beginning of the operator in a type export. So these are all three GHC extensions that H Haskell Source X just hasn't got quite right. And by the end, uh, we had 64 issues tagged as Haskell Source X bugs, but there were probably lots more. And they were all very much these corner case issues. And compatibility really matters for HLint. Every time someone gets a parse error, it means they don't get uh, the hints they were looking for. Sometimes they get a bug report, have to upstream it, wait for a fix. 
it's just not a pleasant experience. So in 2018, it was time to revisit this decision. Do we go for Haskell source X or GHC API? Now, the, c the conclusion is much clearer. GHC, you don't need to modify it. So the fact that it's hard to modify is kind of irrelevant. It's got a reasonably regular release cycle. Um, but actually, I also don't care about that because I'm not modifying it. It's 100% compatible with GHC because it is GHC. And that's really where Haskell source X has been hurting us. But there are kind of some downsides. Every version of the GHC API has fairly major changes. And it's just not as pleasant a library to work with. But we look at Haskell source X. Well, actually, many of the things I liked about Haskell source X are less true over time. It now has a slow release cycle. It's had quite a few maintainers over the last few years for fairly short periods. Um, and Inchlint is now the biggest user of Haskell source X, kind of making Haskell source X kind of Inchlint's almost a part of Inchlint now. Uh, so the kind of reuse benefits from a library are just no longer there. So now, I still, there are still many things I love about Haskell source X, but the conclusion to move to the GHC API uh, kind of is inescapable. So Inchlint should change the GHC API. But there were two downsides. So every version of GHC changes massively, and it's not as nice as a library. So how can we try and address these? So Hlint is really, really tied to the AST. Essentially, it will walk over the comments, the extensions, the pragmas, the expressions in one way, the expressions in another way, the patterns, looking for brackets. Basically, if you change any detail of the AST, you will probably break something in Hlint. Uh, Hlint also wants to support multiple GHC versions. Uh, currently, it supports 8.6, 8.8, and 8.10. We don't want to tell the users of Hlint that if they want the new version of Hlint, they need to upgrade to GHC 8.10. Personally, I'm still on GHC 8.6 on my home machine. Uh, so allowing this flexibility of people using different GHC versions is really important to us. So what can we do to deal with the fact that GHC changes in every release, and you have to use the GHC API that corresponds to your GHC release, and that we want to support multiple GHC releases? Well, we could use CPP, maybe, or we could do something else. Actually, we could do CPP, but I think it would probably be the death of the HLint project. So we've done one transition since moving to the GHC API, and that was GHC 8.8 .8 to 8.10. It involved changing 40 files, uh, which meant uh, about 400 lines changed, approximately. <clears throat> So think what would happen if we'd done that using CPP to support the old and the new. I reckon that's about an additional one and a half thousand lines. Uh, so you've got the old line, the new line, the if Glasgow Haskell blah before it, the else, and the end if. So basically for every line we've changed, 400, multiply that by about five to get the number of lines changed. So this is 1.5 thousand lines per release on a 9,000 line project is a bit grim. And when we're then supporting another release, is it another 1,500, 2,000 lines? Ugh. Also, that much CPP is basically going to kill the IDE experience. It's going to suck to develop. It's not going to be a fun project to evolve. Every time a user submits a contribution, I'm going to have to ask for them to write it in three flavors. So you can't just hack on Hlint. You have to hack on Hlint with three different compilers for every PR. That's going to kill contributions. And also, with that much CPP, it's going to be impossible to refactor. So no, I don't think CPP is feasible. Uh, we need to do something better. And that something better is use the GHC parser. But whereas Haskell source X forked the GHC parser and then changed it, what if we just took the GHC parser and wrote a script to copy it into a separate library? So as GHC evolves, we rerun the script. So we produce basically a version of the GHC API that isn't tied to the GHC release cycle. So we can get a newer GHC version 
or the newer GHC parser running on an older GHC version. So I had this idea about four years before the implementation, uh, but it took about four years for someone to actually go and do it. Uh, and the result is uh, GHC lib. And this is available on Hackage. So there are two package, packages. GHC lib parser is just the parser bits of the GHC, the abstract syntax tree, and everything that needs to run. And that's 194 modules. And GHC lib is everything else. So this is code generator, type checker, optimization, simplifier, all that stuff. And that's three, an additional 327 modules and also depends on GHC lib parser. Neither of these are fast to compile. You're looking at compile times of like five to 15 minutes, um, but they do work on multiple GHC versions. Uh, in particular, GHC promises that you can bootstrap it with the last three GHC versions. Uh, so GHC lib relies on that guarantee to produce a GHC lib that also works on the last three versions. And if you look, you can see something like GHC lib uh, 8.10.2. Uh, today's the date it was released. That's just GHC 8.10.2 released, but now you can use it for GHC 8.6. And this is what HLint does. And you know, the one caveat is it doesn't ship with like the base libraries compiled for GHC lib. Uh, you have to do that yourself. But for something like HLint, where we're just using the parser, it's not a problem. How's GHC lib implemented under the hood? So GHC has lots of generated code and a custom build system. It's really not a cabal package you can just install. So the way GHC lib works is it runs the build system a bit, you know, compiles all the generated files. It then starts to move the sources around to try and resemble what would look like a cabal package. There are some packages that GHC depends on and must match the version of GHC. So there's template Haskell, I think there's a GHC prim and a GHC heap, and it merges those dependencies into GHC itself. It applies some patches that are needed to make it work standalone, writes out some cabal libraries, and all in all, it's about a thousand lines of code to go from GHC to GHC lib. But the important thing is that thousand lines of code, every time a new GHC rolls out, run that thousand lines of code, upload the result to Hackage, and HLint can use the latest version of GHC all the time without run it worrying about CPP. And uh, credits for GHC lib go to Shane Fletcher and Digital Asset, uh, who did all this work. So, why is GHC a worse experience than Haskell SourceX? So there are lots of things. It's just not really designed as a library and that shows in every kind of corner. So you can't show to debug your types. You have to use pretty printing and the GHC pretty printer requires uh, quite a lot of context. You know, it requires a din flags object. So it's quite hard just to do print style debugging. It has lots of abstract types, so HLint relies a lot on pattern matching. Abstract types really screw that up. It has a lot of names, so like there's IDs, names, RDR names, just lots of different types of names, which makes sense in a compiler where you're moving between stages and you're trying to micro-optimize the names. But for something like uh, HLint, a string is just fine. So that may, that's added complexity. Type families, poor documentation, Lots of partial functions, lots of helper functions that just look a bit odd. Um, there are some places they've merged pattern extra in a way to deal with parser complexities that are quite difficult to deal with. Um, and it has really long compile times. Uh, is someone asking a question on the chat? Um, yes, I, if, if before you, um, uh, hello, Kimi, you're here. Yep. Um, what do you mean by abstract types that um, make GHC worse? Uh, so, so for example, the I think the ID type is abstract. Uh, internally, it's or one of those types is something like a qualified name or an unqualified name or a primitive name. And for HLint, that would be really useful to see. But instead, it's an abstract type in GHC with 
testing functions, is it qualified, is it this, and selection functions like get me this bit, get me that bit. And the testing and the extraction functions are usually not complete. They're usually approximately most of the information. So whereas HLint, uh, whereas Haskell SourceX just has Q name or qual, qual or unqual, which is much simpler to work with at the level I'm playing with. So, so you cannot pattern match on it, basically? No, you can't. Um, and that's true for a reasonable number of types in GHC. OK, thank you. Cool. And what does this do to my code? Well, the top two lines are what it looked like in Haskell sort, with Haskell SourceX. And the bottom you know, 10, 12 lines is the GHC equivalent. I suspect this is the worst case, but I did actually pick this at random. I just found a line and went, OK, well, zoom back through the diff to what was it before. But you can see we are able to pattern match here, but the pattern match uh, is on a much more complicated structure. The L underscore is the locations, which you don't usually care about. Um, a la an HS Lambda has a matching group that has a match. The right-hand side of a, is a GRHS, -S, uh, which contains a GRHS. So you can see there's a lot more structure. And if you just look at the last two lines of this, which is just generating syntax, we've got no X field, no syntax expra, no syntax expra. It's just a much more complicated system to work with. So what's the solution to that? Suck it up. You know, the code got a bit longer, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, it's worth it for GHC compatibility. We're also working on libraries like GHC lib parser EX, credits to Shane, uh, and more abstractions tailored for the GHC API. So we can build pattern matching on top of this uh, using the selectors and using things like pattern synonyms in your GHC, but we haven't done yet. So we've decided we're going to change parser. How do we concretely go about changing parser? So HLint is used and is very popular. Um, uh, it has, you know, you can see the commit graph at the bottom. There's really no gap in commits where we could kind of stop doing everything, convert the whole system, which we reckon was going to take on the order of months, three, six months odd. Uh, so stop the world conversion wasn't feasible. So how do we convert? Incrementally. So the idea was to do some preparation to get ready to support both syntax libraries, convert things one module at a time, uh, and then at the end, clean up all the preparation work. And we wanted to make regular releases and accept normal contributions throughout this process, partly so we could catch bugs. So if we kind of did some of the conversion and it didn't work, people would tell us. But at the same time, there is an API to HLint, and we want to minimize the number of 0 0.1 bumps and API breaks we can do. So we did want to kind of batch all the API breaks together. The HLint architecture works as approximately there are pieces that are support and pieces that are hints. So the support is things like parsing the command line, testing, parallelism, but also kind of mini libraries uh, like scope utils is a library for saying whether a module exports an identifier, whether it might export an identifier, how you might need to qualify it. So kind of a library useful for the kind of things HLint does. And then you have the actual hint groups themselves. There are 17 hint groups, things like comments, brackets, monads, pragmas. Uh, and then there's one kind of special hint group match, which takes uh, user defined rules, which is how the map map and concat map are both implemented. Uh, and there are 754 of those hints. So what did we do in prep? First thing, we deleted whatever we could. Uh, so HLint introduced support for YAML files, but still retained the support for Haskell files. We deleted the Haskell files. A anything we could do to shrink the size of the code before the migration seemed like a good idea. We supported quick check generation. That hadn't worked for years, so delete it. Uh, and we also removed support for older GHCs. Then next, we added the GHC lib dependency. So we were quite aware that it was a huge dependency and it might break something. 
so what we did is we just added the dependency but didn't use it. Uh, and that basically ensured GHC lib compiled for everyone. And to our surprise, that didn't break anything. So we put out a release with it, life went on as normal. So now we can start using it. One of the things we wanted to do was abstract the API. So HN has an API and that API uses Haskell source X types. And that will have to change if you don't use Haskell source X. So uh, we made some of the fundamental operations in the API abstract. So for example, there was a function pass module EX that took the source code and returned a Haskell source X module and the comments. So we just abstracted that to module EX, which under the hood was just those two things. Um, and we did all that kind of in one release to try and make the API forward compatible as we change things in the future. And then once we'd done that, the next thing was to pass every file twice. So we changed module EX from being just the Haskell source X stuff to being the Haskell source X stuff and the GHC module, which is a located HS module GHC PS. So now we passed twice in this pass module EX and propagate errors if, that, if either failed. Once we have this, we can pass this module structure to every hint and it can use either one at once. So there are a bunch of bugs. It actually turns out in a library that has a API that kind of exports things that weren't totally intended. Uh, we screwed it up in version 2.1.18, fixed it in 2.1.19, but also screwed something else up. These are things like changing the parser error type to include GHC values. So we roll back those and they're marked as uh, deprecated on stackage. But the real kicker was in 2.1.21, we got a report that suddenly uh, Haskell IDE engine users were getting seg faults from uh, HLint. That wasn't good. Um, uh, fortunately, Moritz Kiefer figured it out. So GHC has a global variable that it called, modif modifies with a function called get or set lib HS GHC, which basically has its mapping of uh, string identifiers to their real names. And GHC API and GHC lib parser were both writing to the same global variable, but because they weren't the same, because the representation of the fast string had changed, they were completely corrupting it. And had the representation not changed, they've just corrupted the value without possibly causing a seg fault, which might have even been worse. So patch goes into GHC lib, all is good. So now we're at the point where we want to convert each hint individually. Uh, so for each hint, it, use, it could switch from the HSEAST to the GHCAST, nice and easy. And at the same time, move all the kind of mini libraries that we'd used over to the GHCAST. So for example, the first one to use scope had to convert scope from the old to the new. We picked the idea of go from the easiest to the hardest. So as we went along, we'd have more experience, more knowledge of how these things worked, uh, and also more of the utilities would be ready when we got there. So first one to change was new type. Uh, this is a fairly simple hint. It just suggests if you've got a data of a single field, it should be a new type. Uh, each package of hints in, in HLint has a bunch of tests. So this had 18 test cases that check all the corner cases. Like, you know, if it's in hash, then it's a bad idea to convert it to a new type because it's no longer kind correct. Um, so these test cases were basically how we ensured that we didn't break anything while we were doing it. And this was uh, four files changed, 123 lines, three, three lines added, 42 deleted. So one module changed, one utility library added, um, nice and easy. And thanks to Georgi Lubinov for doing that chain, that uh, port and various other ones. Next one we converted was naming. Uh, this followed pretty much the same pattern. Nothing interesting. And we just iterated. One of the bigger ones, hint number 11 of 17, was extensions. Um, and this one was 250 additions, 150 deletions. And credit to Shane Fletcher for that one. Uh, skip this. Uh, 
And then the final one was uh, H-Lint, uh, was hint number 17, which was the match hint. Um, uh, this is the one that basically now in H-Lint, the concat map hint isn't built in. It's in a YAML file that says, if the left-hand side looks like concat of map, the right-hand side, the replacement should be concat map. Uh, and F and X are single letter variables, which we use as unification variables. So for every sub expression we match, check the unification, check any side conditions and substitute. Unfortunately, I don't know how many lines this one was because it was done over several PRs, but I, th I think probably in the range of 500 or so. Then we got onto the clean up and polish phase. So <clears throat> we, we move very fast during this period, uh, whatever worked. If you kept the tests working, the actual implementation was not massively important. So now came up the time to clean it up and make HLint into a nice code base once more. So we deleted all the unused mini libraries. So we, we had the old version of scope and the new version of scope. We deleted the old version of scope. We moved the modules around. Uh, so we'd put modules kind of wherever they were already. That didn't make sense anymore, so we jiggled them around. In the conversion, to avoid clashing with names, we put primes on most of the GHC things. So the scope library has a scope type, and we made the GHC scope type scope prime. Um, so we removed a lot of primes, a lot of patches removing primes. We removed Haskell source X entirely. <clears throat> which also required removing all the HSEA, HSE types on the API, breaking the API once more. And the things here were things like fixities. So fixity is just a triple of the name, the associativity, and the precedence. So it's not an interesting type, but we've been using the HSE one because that felt right. We'd have loved to switch to the GHC one, but it turned out GHC didn't really have a good uh, fixity type. Uh, so we put our own in. Similarly, things like pass options, we've been using the Haskell source X one, so we came up with one that was more compatible with GHC. This was, these were kind of breaking changes. Uh, they break the API, so we wanted to do these all in a batch just before the 3.0 release. Uh, so we got the 3.0 release ready, wrote a release post, uh, and you know, we were just waiting to press the button. And we had a suspicion that when we press the button, a bunch of things that we hadn't thought about would break. Um, so we waited. And then my family all caught COVID in March and uh, we were all a bit weak. You know, don't catch COVID is my advice, it's no fun. Um, so it took quite a while for us to all recover and get back to full strength. Um, and we made the decision to wait until we were at full strength. I was at full strength before releasing. So the last release before the 3.0 was uh, in February. And then three, three months later uh, in May, we released 3.0 with 52 changes uh, in the change log and 11 API breaks. And what happened? Lots of bugs, which we expected. Uh, in the month following the release, we found uh, 13 separate regressions. Uh, we made nine releases to address these regressions, and one of these regressions necessitated an API change, bumping us straight up to 3.1. Uh, so the change log just restricted to the regressions is on the left, not so interesting. But what I really like is the number of days since the 3.0 release plotted with the number of bug fix releases we made. So uh, one day later, within the day, we'd made a release. Three days later, we met, had to make another three releases. Then we had like a three day period before another release, then like a six day, then slightly longer. So it fits a perfect logarithmic curve. So I thought that was very fun. Uh, and we were able to fix all the bugs quickly, but after a month, most of them were gone. So what kind of bugs did we encounter? Well, we encountered a bunch of bugs with language fragments. So in the first, 3.0 release, if you wrote language safe comma GADTs, the GADTs was fine and the safe caused a pattern match error. That wasn't great. That was pretty fatal to a lot of people's code. 
Uh, we also didn't support negation, either on the command line or in a language pragma. We, in, we, we, we didn't do anything harmful, but we didn't honor the no GADTs. It wouldn't cause a parse error. And for things like magic hash, where turning it on or off can break your code, uh, that's quite important. And the reason this happened was because Haskell SourceX provides an API saying pass extension. And that API can deal with uh, any extension and no in front of an extension to be the negation of an extension. Very nice. The GHC API we switched to doesn't have those properties. It requires it to be an extension. But not only that, it requires it to be an extension that isn't one of about five special extensions, things like safe, trustworthy, and a few others. Not really sure why an API exists that is most but not all extensions, but I guess that's what the compiler needed to do, because I guess things like safe and trustworthy are handled at a different level. So here we had a lot of problems with Haskell SourceX offering us one thing, GHC offering us a different thing in similar packages, and us moving uh, without paying attention. Next fun bug, infix declarations. So HLint doesn't know what infix declarations are in scope, so it guesses. And its standard guess is to basically use all of those in base, a bunch of those that are in common libraries, so Lenge, HSpec, QuickCheck, Esqueleto, and Lattices. Quite how Esqueleto and Lattices made it onto that list, I'm not sure. My guess is a PR from those maintainers because those seem the less popular of those libraries. Plus things that are tricky, like the on, uh, can break a lot of libraries if you misfix it. it. And then we need to merge that with user-defined uh, infix declarations, both those in the file and those in the YAML file, and plumb it all together. And basically, we got this all kinds of wrong. Uh, it was one of the first things we implemented when we kind of did the preparation work. Is poorly tested in HLint. HLint has amazing tests for the hints and less tests for the infrastructure things like fixities. Uh, so we did it fast at the beginning. We didn't even realize we needed to revisit it or we might have done at the time. We didn't put tests in, uh, it was just a mess. Once we knew it was a mess, it was very easy to fix though. And then there were the bugs where GHC has a slightly odd API. So with GHC, you, part, you pass a value to the, a string to the parser, and either it says part P OK or P failed. P failed means it failed to produce an abstract syntax tree. P OK means it produced an abstract syntax tree that might be absolutely garbage. Um, uh, you, can also, you can then ask the results of P OK, do you have any error messages? And it might say yes. We actually knew GHC did this weird P OK means P not OK trick. Um, but we thought, well, in the cases we're aware of, it gives us an abstract syntax tree that matches the user's intent, even if it's still a parse error. So it'd be really great if HLint continued to work, even though the user's got a parse error. Fantastic. Unfortunately, we found with the example at the top of the slide, if you have f open bracket g at x, if you run it with no type applications enabled, that's a parse error because that at symbol is only a pattern. It can't appear there. GHC gives a POK, but unfortunately it gives a PH POK with F open bracket underscore open close bracket as the parse tree. HLint looks at this and goes, ah, those brackets around that underscore are completely redundant and suggests to remove them. So this was a case where GHC does something surprising. We actually knew it did something surprising but then we still screwed it up anyway because GHC did something even more surprising than we were expecting. Nice and fixed now. And then finally, the fun one, we made it accidentally quadratic. So minus minus cross is an unused operation. Uh, it still works. We had tests for it. It does work. Uh, but someone duplicated a field in a list comprehension once with the old GHC, once with Haskell SourceX and once with GHC. And then when we removed it, they ported the old one to GHC2. So we had a quadratic bug with cross. Bit of a shame, but uh, all fixed in the end. Neil, could you, could you please say something about what a um, double dash cross means for, for those who are 
a little bit um, rusty with your H lint. Uh, so, so if you're rusty with H lint, um, e even if you're very familiar with H lint, I don't recommend using dash dash cross. Uh, so there is one hint in H lint uh, that works between modules, and you can enable that with dash dash cross. And that's the hint that says, have you duplicated an expression or a sufficiently large sub-expression between two modules? Uh, and dash dash cross says, give uh, all the modules on the command line to the duplicate checker at once. So it can find duplicates between modules rather than just within a module. The duplicate checker isn't that good. I would not recommend turning on dash dash cross. Um, but if you do, it should probably be linear rather than quadratic because it's quadratic in the number of modules. And at 200 modules, it really does get pretty insane. Right, uh, many thanks. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, so this was a case of performance and performance benchmarks are hard. So conclusion, uh, it worked. Uh, it took us about a year, uh, you know, 10 days, uh, just a month over a year. And during that time, we made 31 releases. Uh, there were 229 PRs during that time with 23 contributors, but only three of those contributors were focused on conversion. Um, during that time period, we had 818 commits, and we basically changed 8,500 lines, which of a 9,000 line project isn't bad going. And the other thing I like is that I didn't personally convert a single hint. Uh, I did a lot of the prep work and a lot of the cleanup work, but I didn't convert a single hint. That was mostly uh, Shane and uh, Georgi, I think. Um, and now where are we? Well, we have few, maybe even no GHC incompatibilities. No one's reporting. They used to be reporting them every few days. That has stopped entirely. Um, and I guess my question to you would be, did the HLint users notice that we were making this change? Uh, and then at the end, have they noticed improvement or just not noticed anything? So yeah, any questions? Well, well now that you have um, th this experience with the GHC API, especially the parser, um, I, I think um, that that slide that you made about POK was uh, very interesting. and. Uh, you know, what is your opinion about the quality of the parsing code and the design of it? <clears throat> um, so, so it's re so the GHC code base is really old and really gnarly. Um, and I have a talk on ideas. In fact, my talk at ideas uh, last uh, year at MuniHack had a whole section ranting about how bad the GHC API is. Um, I think the kind of worst bug the one of the worst things I've seen in the GHC API is when you type check a module, uh, it spits out the warnings, not as a value, but by calling the print method on the DIN flags, but not calling the print methods on the DIN flags you pass to type checking, calling the print method on the DIN flags that you pass to parsing, which might have been an entirely different method ages ago. So it's pretty grim. There's lots of IO, lots of mutation, but it does do everything. And because Haskell's so flexible, you can pretty much wrap it into a pretty nice API. So a lot of power, it would have been great if they designed a library and then built a parser on top of it. But you can tell from the history that that wasn't how things went. Uh, Pepe? Hi, Neil. Um, I was wondering if you noticed any performance differences between the old parser and the new parser? Um, so so I, some performance differences in the parsing bit. I think the new parser is slightly faster. It builds you know, IDs rather than strings. It's uh, more optimized. You know, it's had many years. Uh, but overall, I think there has been a performance regression. We haven't really measured it, but it's uh, moderate, I would say. Uh, there are lots of places where uh, we use a lot of Uniplate and the GHC API has a lot more abstract syntax tree bits. Uh, so anything where you're walking over the full abstract syntax tree tends to have got more expensive. Um, there are things, we used to be very uh, diligent about things like space leaks with stack limits and stuff, 
we had to give them up because there were too many GHC functions that were blowing the stack that we couldn't investigate. So one of our tasks is to measure performance and improve performance because uh, we know it has regressed during this time. Uh, Adam? I mean, I think it's it's fairly much universal, universally agreed now that the GHC API is a bit rubbish. But I think what seems to be trickier is working out how to improve it. I mean, do you have any insight in how GHC itself might uh, find a path to, to improving the API? Um, so, so I guess uh, for the, I, I guess it's changing a bit too much to make significant improvements. So things like trees that grow are, seem to be embraced half or maybe 70% now. Um, so I think there's work on going in directions that hasn't been completed. So I think that would help. Um, I am skeptical you'll be able to change like all the IO refs in type variables incrementally without losing performance. Because you know, I'm sure you could write a pure version that was just as fast, but I'm not sure you could change the existing GHC version to a pure version that was just as fast. Um, the other thing is it's hard to experiment in GHC because it's such a big code base. So my hope is people will experiment with utility libraries wrapping GHC into a nice API the ones that turn out to work well can get upstreamed and then slowly we can start to hide the ones that don't. But I don't think it's a fast process. Um, Powell? Powell, did you raise your hand? Yeah, I had a question, but I answered by Googling. So. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Pepe, do you still have a question or is that just a stale raised hand? Sorry, I forgot to lower my hand. <laughs> cool, cool. Uh, any other questions? Well, let me ask a question. Um, do you have any general advice that you would give your former self on what uh, you could have done or wish you would have done differently? Uh, not really. I think it went, you know, we, we came up with a plan. We executed the plan. Uh, I think we weren't expecting it to take a year. <clears throat> we were expecting to kind of devote more time, uh, but I don't think there was any harm in it taking longer than a year. Um, so no, I, I think it actually, I'm pretty happy with how it went. Um, maybe HLint should have more tests of the whole features like the fixed T, features like the command line. Essentially anywhere there wasn't a test, we had a bug. Um, uh, and we've got pretty good tests, but not perfect tests. So yeah, I'm, I was expecting it to go worse. So my fe I guess my advice to my future self would be be more optimistic. <laughs> so are there any further questions? Uh, I um, see a question in the Slack. Yeah, um, uh, have, you had, I, have you used Haskell names and have you had any insight on replacing it by GHC based tooling? Um, I was very keen to look at G Haskell names when it first came out. But then the development stalled. There, there was a whole work on Haskell Suite. So trying to take Haskell source X and add a parse, a name resolution and a type checker on top of it, which I think would have been great to make a kind of really good usable as pieces compiler. So I really love that effort. I think it's stalled. Um, the other thing is, uh, G is Haskell, so Haskell names wanted to do perfect name resolution. And because HLint works on a module at a time, it needs to do imprecise module resolution. So its scope module is approximately Haskell names for where your answer is yes, no, maybe, rather than here's a fully qualified ID. Um, and um, are we open to broader questions? Any thoughts on using PBT for HLint if you don't already use them? Uh, I don't know what PBT is, uh, if someone can answer that. Oh, property-based tests. Um, so HLint mostly uses what I guess you could say are golden tests, but golden tests uh, and a very custom DSL. So essentially at the top of every file, we have a list of comments that are, this input should produce this output. So it's a very custom test runner for HLint. Um, 
I don't think there are many property-based tests, but it's also very, I don't, I don't really know any good techniques for building property-based tests that work over abstract syntax trees, which have to have a lot of invariance to be correct. Um, as for H versus Stan, um, Stan is aiming for knowing information about your code with using the HIE files. Maybe if they'd been around when HLint started, I'd have used those. Um, complementary approaches, I guess, different approaches. Uh, maybe one day you, they could use things like the HLint um, uh, hint list, uh, use that directly, and then we could start to collaborate more. Um, yeah, different approach, um, and yeah, good luck to them, and I, ho I hope they catch other things and people can use them together. I think it was John Carmack who said, basically, find every static checker that you have that will work on your code and run it because they'll all catch something. So the more static checkers we have for Haskell, the better. Um, and there's a question on the Slack chat, I think, or some message on Slack chat. That's someone typing. <laughs> uh, Well, in the meantime, I will ask all to unmute so we can thank Neil for the nice talk. Oh, yes, yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much. Work on, uh, great work on that. <laughs> uh, and Kimmy asks, uh, does HLint have regression tests? Uh, yes. So whenever we catch a bug in HLint, we add a regression test, um, pretty much as a rule. So HLint has a very good test case, um, and it's very rare that we introduce the same bug twice. Um, and that's really what makes it still accessible uh, to beginner contributors. Uh, if the test case pass, um, that's probably a good sign that it works. Cool. Uh, I think that's it for questions then. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much.